At the foot of the Visegrad Mountains, just before the Danube turns sharply to the south, the river splits into two. This is where the picturesque Centendre Island begins. Much of the island is cultivated, but its natural assets are unrivaled, and it's also a main source of drinking water for Budapest. Man and animals have been living in harmony on Centendre Island for centuries. To this day, hundreds of bird species nest on the island. In the last couple of years, several species have returned after disappearing without trace for decades. Beavers seem to feel at home on the recently recaptured riverbanks. However, there are animals who find the return seriously challenging. On hot August evenings, a mysterious phenomenon can be observed in the narrower stream of the Danube. Centendre Island is linked by a single bridge to the mainland, the Zoltan Tildi Bridge at Tahito Tvalu. Under the bridge, peculiar insects appear on the river. Tens of thousands of Danube mayflies, or Ephoron virgos, surface from the water. The swarm grows to hundreds of thousands and flies straight towards the bridge. It's as if the lights on the bridge held the insects spellbound. The entire swarm is trapped over the road. Car drivers can hardly see the road. The mayflies are laying their eggs onto the road and having fulfilled their life's purpose, perish. The mayfly is a protected species. Each one is valued at 30 euros. Thus the damage to the environment this evening is over 30 million euros. The eggs would only survive in the water. Because of the bridge, millions of mayflies have laid their eggs in vain. Their corpses and egg batches cover the road at the end of the swarming. Operation Mayfly. Dr. George Krishka is a lecturer at Erdvashlorand University, a scientist at the Center for Ecological Research of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. But what is he doing bright and early with a colander in the car park of a shopping mall? Many people are unaware that at the edge of Budapest, in between shopping malls, roundabouts and parking lots, there lies a tiny green island, the Dunakesi Marsh. A few years ago, a supermarket chain decided to extend its car park to the area, home to protected species. Surprisingly, the authorities approved the plan. The evidence that George Krishka, an expert in wetland habitats, gave to civilians protesting against the development eventually proved to be more convincing than the evidence presented by the investor, who argued that the marsh simply didn't exist. Since then, scientists have monitored the state of the marsh, which appears to have escaped destruction.
Lately, George Krishka is devoting his time to another conservation problem, the mass destruction of mayflies. He believes that without understanding the life cycle and behavior of mayflies, one can hardly prevent such mass catastrophes as the one at Tahitut Falu. Monitor. On the monitor, we are now seeing the optical microscope image of mayfly eggs. We collected these eggs dry, that is, we recovered them from those mayflies which perished on dry land. These are viable eggs, so if they had been able to return to the water, the chances are that the next generation would have developed from them. Following the laying, the eggs sink to the riverbed, where they hatch into larvae after a longer resting period that lasts until the end of next spring. The larvae develop quickly, feeding primarily on the algae close to the riverbed. In smaller rivers, like the Ipoi and the Raba, mass swarming typically takes place at the end of July and the beginning of August. On bigger rivers, this happens rather in the second half of August. Swarming always takes place in the evening. The larvae swim to the water's surface and molt into winged insects. I'm saying winged insects because larvae become two types of insects. Males become sub-imagos and they have to molt again to reach sexual maturity. Females, however, can begin mating right after their larvae have molted into an insect. It's very important that swarming takes place at the same time, so a lot of insects appear simultaneously, because females then have a higher chance of being inseminated. Mating takes place and then females begin their compensatory flight. The essence of the compensatory flight is to offset the drifting impact of the water. So when they fly upstream for a few kilometers to lay their eggs, the eggs as they drift downstream should arrive more or less at the same spot where the larvae developed before. What inspires most of the larvae to swim to the water's surface at the same time is rather mysterious. Weather conditions probably influence them the most, but the water level may also have an impact on this peculiar phenomenon. In the autumn, the landscape is transformed entirely. This is when the water level of the Danube is the lowest and animals have to cope. Shallower side streams dry up entirely. The little lakes left behind are painted crimson by aquatic plants and bacteria. A few hundred meters from the bridge at Tahito Tfalu, the inhabitants of this backwater have to get by in the narrow forested strip between the Danube and the cultivated lands. Apparently, this is not impossible at all. For a few years now, noisy new inhabitants have broken the silence here. Without so much as a word, newcomers have started to fell trees on the riverbanks. At the edge of the floodplain forest, a curious-looking woodpile is hidden between the trees. The neatly arranged branches suggest that the tree-felling rogues were not there to destroy, but acted with a singular purpose. From the backwater, you can see that the two-meter-tall structure has an entrance and is connected to the river through a carefully made canal. This remarkable feat of engineering is a testimony to the work of the Eurasian beaver. Similar to the mayfly, it returned to the island after decades of absence. But the entrance of the beaver lodge seems to be unkempt. At low water levels, the hideout is no longer safe. The beavers moved on to search for new accommodation, a place where water protects them from intruders. On their journey, they only had to follow the ebbing Danube. Certain aquatic animals, however, have a rather peculiar way of finding essential water surfaces. 
Scientists only discovered recently that numerous insects have their own detectors to identify water surfaces. Dr. Adam Egli, a research fellow at the Danube Research Institute of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, is an expert on the vision of aquatic insects. He is researching a special characteristic of light which is only visible to humans with a little help. We humans can only detect two parameters of light, color and its intensity, but it also has a further characteristic, and that is polarization. One can imagine each of the photons that constitute light as small individual waves which have their own well-defined vibrational plane. We can make polarizing filters which make visible for the human eye otherwise invisible polarizational information. They're made up of rather longish molecules. This is why, for instance, if a vertically vibrating photon arrives, and this filter is open to let photons through horizontally, the vertically vibrating photons will be blocked and absorbed. A very good example for strongly polarized light is the light of LCD monitors. These emit 100% linearly polarized light. If we look at it through a polarizing filter, and we turn the filter, we can see that it brightens, then it darkens, brightens and darkens again. This is because the monitor emits vibrating light, which is very orderly. I can let it through the filter, or it gets absorbed by the filter. Generally, the lights we come across are closer to the unpolarized state. Here, from this light source, unpolarized light arrives, which means that the electric field in it vibrates in a random manner. If I look at this through a polarizing filter and I rotate it, I don't see a change in intensity because there are always photons which can get through. If, however, I place another filter in front of it, the emitted light will become orderly because only those photons get through which vibrate in the set direction. If I look at it through another polarizing filter, I can again see the darkening and brightening. And this is what several animal species can detect, unlike us humans. Reflective water surfaces diffuse light in quite a special way, something aquatic insects take advantage of. If light is reflected from an object, let's consider natural water surface as that object, then the reflected light will be strongly polarized. Here we can see a bowl of water. By rotating the polarizing filter that I hold in my hand, we can observe a great change in intensity, which shows that the light is polarized, in fact, very strongly polarized, very orderly, and its vibrational plane is horizontal. This is special because many aquatic insects identify bodies of water based on the polarization of reflected light. In the middle of summer, the Bukersh Creek in Centendre is an excellent location to explore the behavior of aquatic insects. On the banks of the creek, the shed lava skin indicates that for stoneflies and mayflies, the time for mating has arrived. The recently molted insects take flight and try to find a mate by floating above the water. Female green drakes have already finished mating and landed onto the surface of the water, wriggling to speed up the laying of their eggs. When the egg laying finally starts, the exhausted mayflies wait for the thousands of eggs to sink into the cold mountain creek. George Krishka is using an experiment to 
find out why the eggs of some of the insects never even make it to the creek. By now, females which are about to lay their eggs appear in increasing numbers above the black asphalt road. We're now going to test what kind of insects are here by placing these polarized traps. These are light traps, even if they are black, because the small amount of light they reflect is strongly and horizontally polarized, so it very much attracts insects. We can see the creek there under the bridge. This is where mayflies doing their compensatory flight arrive from. As the bridge crosses their path, some of them won't fly under the bridge but over it. Here they simply lose the polarized signal of the water. But notice the asphalt road, which also reflects horizontally polarized light. So they start flying over the road. There is the first green drake. It's reached this strongly polarized surface, which can even induce it to start laying its eggs. Diptera also arrive, lake flies and long-legged flies. Their development is also linked to water. Their larvae live in the water. Stoneflies also identify water by the horizontally polarized light. So this is why they also often end up on the road. Most of them perish before they could even attempt to lay their eggs. Passers-by tread on them and the eggs end up on the asphalt. In ideal circumstances, the larvae hatch from the eggs after 10 to 12 weeks. Larvae may develop in the creek for up to three years. The stonefly larvae live an active life, even under the icy stones. Thousands of eggs laid by the females ensure that the Bukersh Creek and the surrounding forests will be full of life in the years to come. At Tahito Tfalu, the eggs of mayflies survive the winter in hibernation. The larvae only come out in spring. The backwater stream has dried up, the smaller lakes have frozen. Aquatic animals can only find open water surfaces in the bigger streams of the Danube. Mallard ducks did not move south to escape the cold. They seem to find enough nourishment for even the youngest to survive the winter. The backwater stream seems entirely deserted. If snowflakes didn't move, one could believe that time itself froze too in the bitter cold. Strange footprints on the ice reveal that a short while ago, animals wandered around here. Have the beavers returned? Perhaps they don't want to let all the energy they put into building the lodge and the tunnel system go to waste. Whoever was here, the beaver lodge now stands empty. From the tracks, it seems the visitor left quickly, as if he'd only wanted to check on the abandoned property. In winter, nobody wants to start important renovations. Nature's way of getting to spring is by using the least amount of energy possible. Scientists, on the other hand, can't afford to have this rhythm of life. At Erdvosch Lorant University, insect research is going strong, even in winter. Dr. Gabor Horvat is a researcher at the Institute of Physics of Erdvosch Lorant University. One of his research areas is the impact of polarized light on animals. Every aquatic insect and insect in search of water is following horizontally polarized light. Unfortunately, these insects not only find water in their quest, but black, shiny, horizontally polarized, man-made surfaces. Such surfaces include asphalt roads, 
black oil spills, black plastic foil, black tombstones, black cars and solar panels, which are also rather frequent nowadays. This polarized light pollution is a negative thing. Its special and even more dangerous form is when all of this happens at night. For instance, when mayflies fly out of the Danube. This figure demonstrates the dual light trap effect. Mayflies fly out of the Danube and see the bridge lamps which attract them. Direct light is unpolarized, so this attracts them by phototaxis. It's a great paradox why a nocturnal insect is attracted to something which is atypical at night. But it does. The light attracts it. Whoever solves this puzzle will make history in the field of biology. After the mayfly swarm swirls around the lamp, the insects notice the horizontally polarized light which is reflected from the asphalt road. It looks like water, so mayflies are lured towards it, thinking it's the surface of the Danube. The obvious way to overcome this dual light trap effect would be to switch off the bridge lamps. If, however, bridge lamps can't be switched off for road safety reasons, then our other relatively obvious idea was to create competition to these very strong bridge lamps. We have to place a set of lamps onto the bridge, but still over the Danube, so mayflies would be attracted primarily to these lamps. But this won't cause any harm because the mayflies necessarily fall into the Danube where they will still lay their eggs and the next generation could develop in the river. So this is an optimal and environmentally defensible solution. Thus the script of preventing the tragedy is as follows. After mating, females fly towards the bridge during their compensatory flight. They follow the polarized signal of the water upstream so their offspring will drift to the same location where the parents shed their larvae skin. The shadow of the bridge and its mirror image on the water stop the mayflies like a barrier. Moreover, the bridge lamps attract them irresistibly. Mayflies take the asphalt for water so they're not worried about the fate of their eggs. But if they notice the rescue lights, they might be kept above the river. This is a theoretical prediction, so we hope that during the current season, at the next mayfly mating, this is how they will react. They'd better do so, because this is to protect them. Of course, it would be easier to switch off the bridge lamps. The authorities, however, don't allow that. Scientists, therefore, started developing lamps which could be suited to save the mayflies. They want to develop their own model, which could be set up on any bridge and which would allow them to conduct further experiments. In the Danube Research Institute, researchers work feverishly on perfecting the optical barrier. It's important that they know every parameter of the lamps so they can draw scientifically sound conclusions. As we agreed, we can change the intensity of the light as well. This little pot has to be twisted to increase light intensity. Here the width of impulses defines the strength of the light. I suggest this circle be larger and each rod, that is both rods of the optical barrier, should have two light sources each. Then we would need to test whether the system will tolerate this. The laboratory is transformed, and while the lamps are made, it looks like a mixture between a carpenter's and a mechanic's workshop. Everything goes as planned. The only question is whether the plan will work in practice. With the arrival of spring, nature comes to life again. The 
rain wakes up the floodplain forests as well. At the Beaver Lodge, the water level is significantly higher. The entrance is safe again. The inhabitants, it seems, have also returned to enjoy the calmness of the backwater. But wait a minute, something's wrong here. This beaver doesn't have a beaver tail. Instead of a broad paddle-like tail, we can only see a thin little one. This suggests that this is not a beaver, but a river rat, a nutria. Nutrias are originally from South America, but have proliferated along the Danube when some escaped from breeding farms. They don't fell trees, but visibly enjoy the fruits of the beaver's work. Beavers, apparently, have given up on this backwater. Spring is the time of floods, although this causes inconvenience to some species. The renewal of nature would be unimaginable without the spring rains. On the trees lining the riverbanks, the larvae of meadow frog hoppers live in foam nests they've made from sap. It protects them from predators and dehydration. In the floodplain waters, the development of mosquito larvae also begins. From a tiny pond, millions of mosquitoes set off. Under the water, strange creatures are growing everywhere, like the flat mayfly nymph, which lives in rapid creeks, or the frightening predator of calmer waters, the water scorpion. The larvae of mayflies feed almost constantly. They only have a few months to multiply their body weight. They breathe underwater through a gill, the gas exchange is ensured by the continuous vibrating of the feather gills. In the Danube, the larvae of caddis flies will soon pupate and leave the water. The university building, where polarized light pollution was discovered, is about to become the scene of high drama. Birds loitering on the campus of the Erdverschlorand University seem to be waiting for something. On the riverbanks, the first caddis fly appears. First, it looks for a leeward place where it can form swarms with its mates. Windscreens act like magnets. And soon it discovers the window panes of the university. Windows reflect horizontally polarized light, which caddis flies identify as water surface. Arriving at the building, it decides to take a rest, right next to a woodpecker looking for food. Fatal error. The crow missed its chance. But more and more caddis flies arrive. The swarm already has thousands of members. The woodpecker is going on a binge, yet it still can't resist the temptation. And continues the feast. The exhausted caddis flies eventually start mating on the windowsill so less mobile birds also get a chance to have dinner. In the end, surviving females try to lay their eggs onto the windows. Few eggs make it to the Danube. Light traps and polarized light traps are all over the city, but insects try and try again to populate the river in Budapest. The tributaries of the Danube, like the Raba, have more riverbanks in their natural state. Aquatic insects find obstacles here too, nevertheless. Mayflies are also endemic here. The team trying to rescue them 
couldn't have found a better place to test their optical barrier. It's the middle of July and we're by the Raba at Raba Hidvig. Here the river is close to its natural state. Protected mayflies are present in great numbers on the riverbed. Usually the swarming of mayflies takes place earlier on the river Raba than on the Danube. So here we have a chance to have a first go at testing our system with which we try to stop millions of mayflies from perishing on well-lit bridges. We're here to examine the development of the larvae so that we can estimate the likely start of their swarming. If we want to collect samples from strong currents, it's helpful to choose an area where the water is shallow so we can wade in normal wellingtons. Here the riverbed is gritty and pebbly. The way we usually collect here is by kicking up the stones so we'll capture the animals which drift from under the upturned stones with a colander attached to a rod like this one. So I immerse the colander and start kicking the stones and the current simply drift the animals into the trap. When I lift the colander, various animals are moving around in it. Apart from a lot of freshwater shrimps, we can see mayfly and caddisfly larvae. There are caddisflies which make underwater nets and there are those which make cases. Looking at the size of the light-coloured mayfly larvae, we can conclude that swarming will soon begin. In all probability, within a week. One week is not a lot of time, however. The last underwater days of mayflies don't pass uneventfully. The shape of the larvae, which were still tiny in spring, change by the middle of summer. They develop winglets to get ready to fly. They need to stock up on energy because they won't feed during their flight. They're constantly looking for food, so much so that they often fail to notice the approach of bloodthirsty predators. Preoccupied with feeding, the larvae react too late. In the turmoil, one of them ends up right between the raptorial front legs of a water scorpion. The attacker starts feeding on its prey while it's still alive. But others can't relax either. It seems the danger is not over yet. There's no escape from the scary jaws. The larvae of the predaceous diving beetle or water tiger sometimes even attack much larger fish. It's swimming towards the surface with its prey to paralyze it and suck out its sap. It squeezes the last drops out of the unlucky mayfly larva which will now never make it to the surface to take wing. Those which have survived the month spent underwater will soon fly off, where new challenges await them. This year, however, mayflies are getting some help. Scientists from the Danube Research Institute and Hertfusch Lorand University will try their lamps on site for the first time. It's quarter two, so in about a quarter of an hour, the swarming may start. If the plan works, the larvae will surely be saved. Can we run a trial? Okay. One and the other. Well, the first male Sabimago has landed on the bridge. It still hasn't molted, but this signals that swarming will soon begin. It seems that it's all about to kick off.
It is molting right now. It's shedding its skin, so it seems we're in the first stage of the swarming when the male sobimagos fly to the riverbanks, molt into imagas, and the mating can begin. Males molt for a second time and perish after mating. Females, however, will have to make a longer compensatory flight. Scientists still have some time left until the swarm forms. Tonight, we'll reveal whether the plan, based on years of experiments, works in practice. As night falls, the females flying upstream appear. The insects fly directly to the lamps. We're now in the second stage of the swarming. We can practically only see females which want to lay their eggs. They fly for a few kilometers upstream above the water and land on the water surface, exhausted to lay their eggs. Their movement is directed by the horizontally polarized signal of the river. These mayflies that land on the river can thank their survival and consequently that of their offspring to the fact that this lamp is switched on. And it keeps the compensatory swarm above the surface of the water. We can divert the mayflies from the river midline even with a torch. They're coming now. The swarm is approaching and is beginning to engulf us. If we switch off the lamp, then we can observe that they suddenly no longer know where to go, and they're trying to find their way. And this is when they move away from the river to find a light source. Unfortunately, they find one right here, very close. Only a few dozen meters away, there's a strong street lamp, which creates a catastrophic situation for them. They won't lay their eggs onto the water surface, and the next generation will inevitably perish. The crowd of insects, of course, arouses the interest of frogs, too. Those females which have already laid their eggs would perish anyway. The frog leaves the scene with his appetite satisfied. The next morning, mayfly corpses are swinging on the water. The animals laid their eggs into the river Raba, proving that the concept of Djurj Kishka and his colleagues worked. When the optical barrier was switched off, street lamps attracted a huge quantity of insects away from the river. This proved that the continuous running of the optical barrier is indispensable for the survival of mayflies. On Centendre Island, a good 200 kilometers from Raba Hidvig, summer is in full swing. In the air, frightening birds of prey are circling. But on the riverside, it's all peace and quiet. At the southern tip of the island, not far from the Medjeri Bridge, there is some unusual movement under the trees. Somebody is raiding the chutes. A beaver kit. And this time we can be sure that it's a beaver because its flat tail is visible as it's balancing in the water. It seems that its parents decided not to raise it in the backwater stream at the Tildy Bridge. Apparently, they've made the right choice. The little beaver has plenty to eat here for dinner. It's still munching on the leaves, but soon it will be able to fell huge trees on its own. Night falls on the Danube and the little beaver swims back to its parents. On the surface, everything appears calm. Under the water, however, the mayfly larvae are getting ready to take wing. The next day, researchers at Erdvöschlorand University are preparing for the evening swarming. So the plan is that, let's say, here's a section of the Danube, 
Here's the bridge, roughly. These are the bridge lamps. Four, actually, if I remember well, right? The distance between the bridge and the water surface is about the same as the distance between the bridge lamps and the road surface. If they fall onto the road, then we can expect that they'll sooner or later fall onto the water surface. This task is much more daunting than on the River Raba. The bridge at Tahitot Falu is lit entirely. Moreover, the street lamps were replaced by stronger ones in the past year. It's important that the lamps are placed at the appropriate height. If they're too far from the water surface, they won't be able to keep the mayflies there. In the event, mayflies could get further away from the water and lay their eggs on the road. Mayflies hitting the water will obviously survive because the river will drift them further away so they can surely lay their eggs. So the big day has arrived. Researchers estimate that a huge swarming will take place tonight. In the bright August sunshine, the Tildy Bridge looks completely harmless. But the scientists are aware that appearances can be misleading, so they begin to assemble the lights. Tonight, everything has to work to prevent the bridge becoming the scene of yet another massacre. Mayflies also start preparing. The molting begins. The teams work side by side. Ides or orf fish are circling under the bridge expecting an abundant feast. At nightfall, the bridge lamps are automatically turned on. Slowly but surely, the lights are almost ready for action. Scientists only need to attach them to the bridge railings. While the lamps are put in place, hundreds of thousands of mayflies are shedding their larvae skin down below. The brightly lit bridge towers menacingly over the Danube. The male Sobimagos are molting for the second time. Once they finish, they will look out for the females congregating above the river and the mating can begin. The tension on the bridge is palpable. We set up our lights. The mating is probably still underway over the river. Only one or two mayflies have landed on the bridge. By moonlight, more and more mayflies are visible in the air, but the swarm of females is nowhere to be seen. The compensatory swarm has not yet arrived. We haven't seen any sign of it. The swarm ought to show up in the middle of the river, but so far, everything's calm. More and more mayflies emerge from the Danube, but only shed larvae skin is drifting on the river so far. Nevertheless, the researchers think it's better to switch on the lights as the compensatory swarm can arrive any minute. Female mayflies start arriving continuously from the lower parts of the river. Some of them are beginning to circle around the lights. The technique seems to be working well so far. When the number of impregnated females reaches a critical mass, the mayflies begin to fly upstream. The swarm's coming. The swarm has just arrived. Hundreds of thousands of mayflies are arriving at the bridge and heading straight to the lamps of the scientists.
From this angle, we have a good view of the mayfly swarm in front of the lights. They reach the lamps and some of them turn back and then head towards the lamps again. So in fact, they're making a circular movement in front of the lamps. Of course, it's also an unnatural thing that they're not allowed to complete their compensatory flight and can't keep on flying upstream. Those mayflies which have reached our lamps stay there. This way, we can stop them leaving the river and flying up to the bridge lamps. More and more females are arriving with the swarm and flying into a frenzy in front of our lamps. As we can see hundreds of thousands of mayflies here, we can confidently state that our optical barrier works well, even on a lit bridge. Those insects which stay above the water surface will lay their eggs into the Danube, and thus the new generation can begin. The researchers have achieved their goal. The females escaped, so we'll probably be able to witness this stunning phenomenon next year too. Mayflies are beginning to lay their eggs on the water surface. The crowd is huge. It almost covers the entire river. The riverbed is carpeted with sinking eggs. Laying the egg batches consumes the last energy of the females. The river is also covered by mayflies on the other side of the bridge, so thanks to the lamps, many of them even manage to cross under the bridge. At the end of their mission, the females are completely exhausted and perish. This year, however, their deaths were not in vain. They fulfilled their role in the great cycle of nature, They've done everything they could to ensure the survival of their species. The next day, only the corpses remind us of last night's swarming. For George Krishka and his colleagues, the bigger part of the work is only beginning. Building on their findings, they would like to ensure that every bridge around the habitats of mayflies is fitted with optical barriers. As their articles about polarized light pollution reach more and more people, they hope this will have an impact on urban planning in the future. On Centendre Island, however, the integration of returning and newly colonizing species will, of course, not be without hurdles. The island, which stretches from Visegrad to Budapest, is a good example nonetheless. With a little help, wild animals can survive even next to a metropolis of two million people. The Danube, Europe's second longest river, is an essential resource for humans and animals alike. But right now, it appears that it's up to man what twists and turns this river's destiny will take in the future.